Welcome everybody, thanks for coming today and being with us. As you can see, there are cameras here, so please just be aware that this is being recorded. It's going to go up on the HSAN, the Australasian Humor Studies Network's YouTube channel, where this kind of was born, this idea of Eric's um, talk here about the human right to listen and to be heard, and which is also why we've got amazing guests here with us today to talk about listening, being heard, the human rights angle from all kinds of different perspectives. And I'm going to introduce the guests in a bit. Before I do that, I would just like to welcome you all to the University of Sydney, which is located, located I'd like to acknowledge, on the unceded lands of the Gadigal people of the Aura Nation, who are and have always been the traditional owners. So this event with the tagline, How Do We Listen? It is part of the 2023 Humor as a Human Rights Conference, an annual event hosted by the Australasian Humor Studies Research Network. And you might actually see two more people from the HSA and sneak in a bit late. So let's see if Jesse can what make it. Um, I'm happy to have convened the conference's main events earlier this year with my colleague Rodney Tavera from the American Studies Center here at the University of Sydney. The conference took place in February, where we had two full days of online presentations and two full days of on-campus, in-person panels and talks. One talk was by Eric Loebeck, who presented his listening devices artworks as a series of think pieces on the human right to listen and to be heard, which builds on a humorous platform of visual arts, cartooning, satire and creative plasticity. And if you're interested, Eric's, um, Eric's artworks are already up in uh, the law library uh, they're going to be there for a couple of months, so check them out if you have not already done so. Eric is going to be talking about this in a moment. To start things off, as I just said, Eric will give a very short introduction to his art that you can all find here at the university. And thanks again to Vanessa uh, Belinda from the University Library. Really, really appreciate it. It's a lot of work and you made it happen, so we're very much uh, thankful. Uh, the artworks are accompanied by a set of small sculptures and a video that plays on the monitor screen there as well. So if you walk over there, it's not very far from here, you would say it, you will see it all happen um, there. A lot of my students actually came up to me and say, so is this this artworks thing that you're going to have the event on? Is that Eric? I was like, yeah, yeah. And they were like, I didn't tell them how much they were. <laughs> I can't really afford them. Um, <laughs> but I, yeah, here they are up for sale. So Eric... Yeah. Might help talk to you about that later. Um, there is also a QR code that you can scan with your phone that will take you to the exhibition context and more information about the artwork series that is called, as we said before, Listening Devices. I'm Bernicola, Nicola, lecturer in the School of Languages and Cultures, specifically the discipline of International Comparative Literature and Translation Studies, so that's my background here. And I will be moderating the panel discussion that is going to happen after Eric's short overview at the beginning. I'll be introducing all of the guests, and then just we have a short discussion and then throw it over to the audience for questions and answers. The discussion is every about 40 minutes, give or take, um, 50 if we waffle. So hopefully that's not happening. It will be concluded with a poem read by Saba Asefi, um, a lecturer here at the University of Sydney in the School of Media and a uh, dear colleague. So also again, thanks for coming. Um, then we will stop and open the floor to questions from the audience. With that being said, let me quickly introduce Eric and then throw it over to him. Eric Lobeke. Eric's practice um, is born of his 32 years of participation in the Australian media landscape as a political cartoonist and opinion page illustrator on the Australian newspaper. Since 2016, he has completed a Master of Fine Art by coursework degree at UNSW Art and Design, followed up with a two-year full-time Master's of Fine Art research paper on the topic of disrupting the cartoonist working model for the digital paradigm. This allowed him to continue his painting practice and conflate his inquiry with traditional painting and time-based digital painting to exhibit his work most recently within a cultural institution, the Museum of Australian Democracy, Old Parliament House, Canberra, and within a fine art gallery context, Della Downer Fine Art Gallery here in Sydney in 2020. Give it up for Eric and please come over there. So thank you, Ben, and um, that was the first part of my speech. So really, you, you pretty much know exactly what I'm going to be talking about. First of all, I'd like to um, 
say thank you to the university for having this for me and also for being uh, on Gadigal land and being able to, uh, to speak uh, freely. Uh, so uh, speaking freely is about, is about being able to uh, voice, voice your opinion. So what I do, what I usually do is I, for 32 years, I voice my opinion with, with my drawings on the uh, newspaper. And, um, and that allowed me uh, a, a, big, a big audience. Uh, and then uh, after the 32 years, I was made redundant. And uh, then I had to find my, my, my new way of uh, voicing my opinion again. Um, the point is, uh, I want to be listened to. Uh, and that's, that's a... Um, when when I I look at the way that I do my work, it's it's usually something that that um, requires a, a very uh, contemplative thought and and um, slow slow thinking, uh, which is not what happened when I was at the newspaper. When I was at the newspaper, I was actually just thinking very quickly, and and what I needed to do was I needed to. Um, uh, Put out a drawing within within three or four hours about somebody else's opinion. So I was looking at somebody else's opinion and uh, formulating my own visual from that, and then uh, and then getting it out by seven thirty. So uh, after thirty two years, I got very very good at it, and and I'm very quick at drawing. So I was going to use that in my fine art, um, but it was COVID, and at that time. Um, um, uh, I was doing it so quickly, uh, uh, drawing from the opinion page because I, I knew how to do it so quickly. I had plenty of other times, so I was listening, to, uh, and obviously I was listening to the news, and I was listening to uh, our government at the time, and um, and also we had uh, Donald Trump in um, in the U.S. and uh, and there was a lot of noise being made, and this noise was um, translated in a lot of. A lot of misogyny, I thought, and a lot of um, a lot of um, yeah, uh, a lot of misogyny. So, so what I was thinking about at the time was how our government was looking at at the issue of the Me Too movement at the at the time, and it was really interesting because we also had a government that wasn't listening to women at the time, and so we had uh, Brittany Higgins. Uh, uh, with with her um, rape allegation that was not being listened to, we had Grace Tame, Australian of the Year. She wasn't being listening as listened to, or she 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 made she made a real good point of that. And then we had the, uh, the what really got me going on on these things was that we had a government with no ears, not listening to Christine Holgate, who who came in. Um, and she revolutionised uh, Australian Post. She actually did really well, and um, and she made a really big profit for Australian Post. Yet it wasn't politically um, uh, expedient to have her there. And um, and um, Scott Morrison you know, went up in Parliament and actually um, um, uh, derided her and said, you know, get rid of her. We don't need her. Whatever. So she had to re she had to resign. But then, then uh, at the committee she came in. Uh, so there was a committee meeting about about what had happened, and she came in with with the white suit, and that that really impressed me because I thought, okay, well, what's the white suit about? So in my research, I, well, I found out that the suffragettes uh, wore the white suit. And I thought, okay, well, there's a lot of symbolism happening here, and it's really quite good. So I started thinking about how I could make these uh, earpieces for men with no ears. And so this is, this is probably one of the, the last ones. But I started off, if you go downstairs and have a look, I started off with a big flower because, you know, I mean, uh, being a cartoonist, I was very, very directed on um, um, literal literal uh, interpretations and so a big flower so it starts with a big flower man with it without ears yelling you know so and i kept on going but what i was also doing at that time was because i was transitioning from being a cartoonist to an artist uh, through my mfa i was doing an mfa at the time and i was doing 
what, are, what were called um, works in progress. So the works in progress was me doing my opinion page, but uh, on a weekly basis on one topic. And then they became uh, drawings that were, that were um, made into a, um, an animation. And, and I got my wife to, uh, to actually do the uh, narration for it. And they were published in the newspaper at the time. 75 of these drawings, one a week. So I got really quick at drawing and, and coming up with a logical uh, narrative. So, so it, was, it was good fun to do. And, uh, and my MFA then came up with 75 drawings at the end. But I was also uh, learning how to use the iPad as a, as a painting tool. And, and to me, that was really exciting because it became a really uh, strong, uh, strong painting tool. And I think I came to university with, and Joan taught me at university. And, I, and that was what was in my head at the time. And, uh, and, and Joan said to me, monumentalize it, monumentalize it. <laughs> and so this is monumentalizing it. And so um, I then started using plasticine uh, photo photography and I started to use um, plasticine as a drawing tool on the iPad. And then I had to make them unique because whatever comes out of an iPad gets disseminated to, to a thousand, uh, a million times. So I had to make those works unique. So I then printed them out and I'm painting over the top of them. So to make them unique. So they, all the artworks now underneath us are all unique artworks. And they're, they're artworks that, um, that uh, can be sold in a gallery. And, and that, was the, that was the main reason I did that. But I also do, do the video work because I did the video work for, for work in progress. And so I, I've, I've got an oeuvre now that's a multi-media multi oeuvre. Anyway, so, so really, so we've come to this point where uh, we're, we're thinking about listening and, and, and I've put out these images about uh, listening. And then the good thing about what I do is that I can bring it out to um, a wider audience on, on Instagram and Facebook. And I've got quite a, a nice um, following. It's only a thousand people. But these people actually feed because they, because of the work in progress, they they allow themselves to to give me ideas or, or to to talk to me on on that on that uh, uh, device or on a device. And so um, Virginia McCracken, who does these beautiful um, uh, uh, murals on water tanks, came up uh, and said to me, um, said. Uh, like we only talk on on social media, but I, I've known Jenny for a long time because we used to do chalk the walk together, and uh, and uh, she said um, there is a there is a concept called uh, daradiri, and so this this is the Aboriginal concept of slow listening and respectful listening, and I think this is where I am at the moment. I'm at slow respectful listening, so I think I'm going to leave. I'm going to leave the talk at that point so that we can we can really talk about that point. So thank you. Thank you for listening. Right. Right. So now with this little intro, might I just ask our guests to come up here and just find a chair if you'd like. So we're now just throwing it open to the guests and to talk about, oops, as we're setting up for the discussion round. Talk a bit more about this act of listening and the human right to listen and to be heard. There you go. From these different, oops, just, mm -hmm. Sabo, you want to just mm -hmm. got this? That's fine. Sorry, just mm -hmm. fine. No, that's fine. Um, and find kind of, you know, maybe a common thread, maybe um, we can get this dialogue going more organically. But each of our guests has a very different and distinct take that we found there might be a red thread kind of going through all of these. So just quickly, um, I'm going to introduce the guests in alphabetical order. You already know Eric, but you do not, I think, maybe know who Joan is. Um, so Joan Ross, bold ex and experimental. Joan Ross's practice investigates the legacy of colonialism in Australia with a particular focus on reconfiguring the colonial Australian landscape and drawing attention to the complex and ongoing issues surrounding the effects of globalization and colonization. 
Since the late 1980s, Joan has exhibited across a range of mediums from drawing, painting, photography and sculpture to installation, video and virtual reality. Recent projects include designing the hoarding for the Art Gallery of New South Wales with Sydney Modern Expansion and illuminating the facade of the National Gallery of Australia during the 2021 Enlightened Festival. In 2023, Joan received the National Art School Fellowship, congratulations, mm -hmm. and the Valerie Taylor Art Prize for Ocean Advocacy. And I urge you to check out her work, the neon work with the IVs colours. I think it's brilliant and I just pops off the screen, so I'm really a big fan of that. Um, Nicole Matthews, just here, um, hails from Macquarie University, it was nice to come all the way and help traffic, <laughs> okay, we talked about that. Um, Associate Professor Nicole Matthews lectures across media and culture studies at the Department of Media, Music, Communication and Cultural Studies at Macquarie University in Sydney. Nicole's work brings together autobiography, disability and deaf studies, popular genres of broadcast and electronic media, and education. Her current research focuses on the convergence between mobile phones and digital hearing aids and considers the way these technologies might shape the way hearing, hard of hearing and deaf people imagine these wearable technologies and the people who use them. So we've got the technology kind of coming in here, like with Eric's painting style there as well. She has a long-standing interest in social justice-oriented listening in both political and professional settings. Her enduring interest is the role of media in processes of social and political change. Welcome, Nicole. Thank, Thank you for coming. Then we've got Rats. Uh, Bedlington, Ratters, is a Canberra-turned-Sydney artist whose work started with painting but has since collected every medium encountered, in particular performance installation, to maximise maximalize, I think was the word, maximalize their shows. Inspired mainly by self-run bad art competitions, <laughs> erotica from the 70s to 80s and medieval art, their work has an often kitsch, pornographic and absurd presence. Rat's work tends to focus on the idea of shrines, portals and spaces of contemplation. And like cognate, what is it? Cognitive? Oh. I'm not sure it's been well. <laughs> offers an installation of spaces containing personal utopias or the artist's experience. Again, welcome, Matt. Thank you. And last but not least, uh, Saba Vasefi. Dr. Saba Vasefi is a multi award winning journalist, poet, and documentary filmmaker. She is an honorary postdoctoral associate at Macquarie University, an academic at the University of Sydney, Sydney Peace Foundation Council member, and the Red Room Poetry's Writing in Resistance editor. Her poems have appeared in various journals, including Transnational Literature, Rasafiri Magazine of International Contemporary Writing in the UK, Cordite Poetry, Australian Poetry, International Peer Review Journal, Song, and The Best Australian Poems 2022, and the Art Gallery of New South Wales. She is the editor of Borderless, a transnational anthology of feminist poetry published in 2021. And also, because she is a poet, um, Saab is going to do a reading performance of a poetry piece um, before we do the Q&A and after we conclude the discussion. Again, welcome to all of you. Maybe a quick round of applause for me. <laughs> and we agreed beforehand that this is more like a, a less formal situation, not like an examination. <laughs> so um, I was just going to throw it out with a question about so how does listening and hearing the right to listen, the right to be heard, the human rights aspect. How does any of this factor in your artistic practice, your professional practice? Has it inspired you in any way, shape or form? Maybe changed over the years, like we all have been in touch kind of a couple of times go back and forth. Um, and this is not for anybody like in particular. So anyone who might want to get us started there, please feel free to do so. I mean, I, I think that's really interesting shift happening in political culture around, um, you know, the, a shift from saying, well, people need to speak and we need some voice. 
which I think was really important for the last few decades, to people going, well, yeah, it's all very well to ask people to talk about their pain, about the things that they've experienced as marginalised people or, you know, uh, other negative experiences that others might learn from, but it's pretty unethical to get them to do that without them listening to those stories. And so the Me Too movement would be one example, but there's lots of others. So I think that sort of shift to saying, well, it's a responsibility, our collective responsibility and the responsibility of empowering people to listen and, you know, not to expect people to have to tell the stories again and again and again and again. That's kind of seemed to me underpinning what Eric was saying, and I think that's a really important aspect of um, my work and things that are going on. Right. Yeah, and I think nobody wants to chime in immediately. I think, Nicole, what you were saying about that listening becoming not just, you know, the, the chore of, oh, I have to listen, but actually it needs to be, like, integral to the... The whole process and it needs to be part of the consultation like uh, you might not know about the university of sydney our department of indigenous studies aboriginal education a fantastic department i'm working with one of my colleagues over there and that's where we like did a podcast on the theory that could be listening and stories of country and that's what she taught me the first thing was like i'm a non-aboriginal person like to listen and what does listening mean with a purpose intently not coming with all of the assumptions you have and so I think that's why I'm drawn to Eric's work so much because it's really <laughs> giving you this like jolt and making you aware that listening can happen in different ways. Um, anybody else? Have I could that? add to that. Yeah, I <clears throat> was thinking about looking at Eric's figures and I really enjoy how it looks like you're kind of trapped in a conversation with him or they're trapped in a conversation with you rather. So it's like when you look at the image, it's like they're forced to listen to something that you're trying to say which I really enjoy. And I was thinking about when I paint, I paint a lot of figurative paintings. So there's always like a figure, um, which for me, they're always a personification of an idea or a thing. I was just talking earlier about how I'm focused on like astrophysical phenomena and sort of turning that stuff, which is really hard to comprehend into kind of a, a figure, like a human figure is really interesting. But when I'm painting them, they're still, I just kind of use these like male forms as a kind of perverse, like, sort of turn in the gaze on them as well. Um, but I feel like I'm painting them into being and they're forced to listen to my conversation. So I think that's really fun. I like that <laughs> about that work. Yeah. <laughs> that works. Yeah. Yeah. So what I'd like to say is that that work. So we, we have a lot of people that, that are speakers, a lot of people that talk and, and, you know, the governments were like that for the last, so the, the recent had uh, the recent government hasn't been, but the ones previous to that were, and they were just talking, talking, talking. But there wasn't a lot of listening, and so we uh, so the the internet has this thing that allows everybody to to shout, to talk, to say, but it doesn't go in reverse that well. You know, it doesn't work in reverse that well. So I think the digital age is is making us. We, we have to find a way to listen in the digital age, I think. Perhaps lurking. Lurking is part of our solution lurking. there. Lurking, you know, in, in internet spaces, okay. going to spaces and not saying stuff. Just oh, listen. Oh. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. I, I made a virtual reality work uh, for a week. I worked with virtual reality. And at the end of that week, I thought, you can't make art in virtual reality. Mm. It's because I felt yeah. like... <clears throat> virtual reality was the most self-centered space that I'd ever been in. So I made, um, I had a very interesting concept and I found that when people watched it, all they were interested in was how big I can grow the flowers and when will that bird land on my hand. <laughs> so then uh, I was in an interview talking about that, saying I would never work in virtual reality again. Uh, I'd rather work with children in hospitals. And I got a light bulb moment. We had an application due for the modern ACME VR commission and I said to the guy, we we're in the interview together, I said, when is that due? And he said, tonight. I said, if we got time, I just came up with the best idea. So my idea was that taking on that it was a self-centred space, that when the VR is turned on, you've got two hand controls and a headset, that you are a colonial woman and that everything that you do to the land, uh, you, you everything you do, so it says don't touch that button or there's rabbits 
If you touch the button, the trees fall down and their cows appear. If you throw the hand grenade, you blow up, you make factories. If you touch a rabbit, it breeds. And if you try to pat another one, it breeds until you can't move from rabbits. Uh, and I feel like, you know, for me, that was, I find really subtle, or oh, actually it's not that subtle. <laughs> funny ways of of trying to get people to listen. Yeah. So, you know, in my work I do a lot of that sort of, uh, they call me the silent punch, you know, like I, I pull you in, I, like I bring you in to look at this and then I'm like whack, mm. you know, because I have really important messages. And I think, I mean, I, I think we live in such a, 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 I don't think people really want to listen a lot of the time. They're just much more interested in, oh, what can I say next? How can I up that? How can I, you know, and I just think that Instagram, for example, is just, you know, making it even more pronounced. Mm. Can I just stay with that for a moment? Because I think I just, that's something I wanted to talk to say, um, Sarah Beat about. So, as John was saying, people don't want to listen. How do you make them listen? How does it work? And maybe all of you, um, how do you make people listen? Maybe even if they don't want to listen, say the silent punch. Um, I try. I mean, I know that. Uh, um, for example, I've I've got a work. I was just a. We had the Hadleys, a hundred thousand dollar art prize. I got a highly commended in it. I was never going to win it, but I got a highly commended. Um, and it's of a an old white man made up of a couple of different figures. Anyway, he's an old white man. Next to him is a a stump of a tree. And behind him is a landscape of of cut down trees. And the title underneath it, so I fake all these up to make them look like old works. And underneath it, it says, uh, those trees came back to me in my dreams. So what I start to do is I start to, uh, I think, you know, as an artist, you have the opportunity to remake the world. Mm -hmm. you, you can you can make things up. You can, uh, and, and what I, I've made, I feel like I've asked this man to go back and regret his actions. <laughs> and I, and I feel that in my work, yeah. I'm I'm giving I'm giving the doorway. I'm I'm opening a door for 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 men like me that don't have the language. I, I I'm learning the language, um, and I'm and I'm opening the door to learn that language, the, the, especially um, the the Aboriginal language, um, and uh, and it's important. I find that really important. It's real. It's a growth uh, process for me because really we're targeting. People of, uh, I'm in this artwork. I'm talking to people of my age and my gender, my my um, uh, you know, uh, I'm I'm uh, a person that that has a lot of agency, which a lot of people don't have. So I think this work opens up those conversations, and 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 I saw uh, Joan's work, and it opened up a lot of conversation. The the, the VR work. Um, and because people were entranced by the fact that they were in this other world, you know, it was a totally different world, and it was a different conversation that that, that was happening. Yeah, right. So maybe, um, Sally, if you might want to comment a bit on that, and then maybe Nicole as well, because it's really not Yeah, um, I think the I have different perspective in the context of Iran, for example. Navigating the notion of listening is kind of meaningless because when you are under religious dictatorship gender apartheid regime there is no voice everything has been suffocated and um, there is always punitive practices behind everything um, you talk about if it is uh, going to cross the regime's hard line so there is no voice it's there is no multivocality, there is not freedom of speech, freedom of expression. All form of creative production should go through censorship of Ministry of Art and Culture. Everything should um, meet the criteria of radical, the radicalism and um, their ideology. Um, everything should, um, you know, the, every production exposed to some sort of, sort of censorship. Um, so when voice is not allowed to exist, how we can think about listening in that sort of environment? So I think in my view, all the carceral spaces which can 
um, be defined as any form of incarceration, which can be carceral space. I am referring to any hybrid form of incarceration in the context of Iran can be as big as a country. Iran is a country, is a prison as big as a country. All aspect of your life is under control, surveillance, and um, suppression. So this is a characteristic of all form of carceral spaces, like detention, like detention regime, like um, dictatorship regime, um, that when voice is not allowed to exist. So this navigating or talking or even thinking about listening is crucial. I guess I've done research in much more sympathetic spaces for the idea of listening. So I did a book a couple of years ago, which was a couple of years ago, which was looking at um, listening to first person narratives in health con context. So things like the NHS in Britain um, and in, say, dementia care training in Australia. And one of the things that was really interesting about that is people widely viewed um, in these kind of health settings, they widely viewed people's stories, the stories of people who are health consumers or patients or, you know, people with disability, whatever, however you want to define it, as being important. But it was very hard for people who were empowered in those health settings to actually listen to those narratives. So they had to kind of try and create, I, I kind of think it's interesting to think about listening as needing infrastructures. So it's not just about individuals kind of conscientization. Oh, I'm a listener now. Um, and obviously part of that is legal structures or judicial structures and political structures. Sometimes it's about um, physical structures, you know, like the, like I've got single side of deafness. So a space that's not very acoustically friendly makes it really hard for me to listen if you're culturally deaf, you know, obviously you need interpreters or you need captioning. Um, so thinking about listening as something that has got a kind of infrastructural dimension and part of that might also be in a sort of affective infrastructural dimension, like thinking through well, what, what makes it possible for people to listen to stories that might be confronting. So, so I spoke to some people who said, oh, look, it's really hard for nurses in the NHS in a sort of time of austerity to hear a story about the failure of the health system, which they're fully aware of, that they feel a sense of, of kind of moral, um, you know, conflict about listening to their values being violated um, because of the fact they're working in a system that's so dr drastically underfunded and, you know, poorly organised and everything. So they're not kind of emotionally able to take on the stuff that's being said, if you see what I mean, yeah. because it's so challenging to their core values that it's just overwhelming. To them. And I think that's a brilliant point, like particularly when I came to Australia, it was like, all right, so you learn about histories and everything, and then you go to an Australian community or person and then you unload that trauma, like, mm -hmm. like just like taking that trauma, and like, yeah, but that's not their job, that's mine to work through. That's interesting. Since yeah. I was, I was yeah. interested in that. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. I really like your point about the nurses being Wants to have to like listen to those stories when they they talk to them. Yeah, yeah, they're listening, but also they when they they're listening to people's everyday stories. But even trying to learn from stories about doing practice differently is difficult when you're in infrastructures, you know, economic frameworks that don't make that easy to do. So you sort of feel bad that you're not doing what you should be doing. The people are saying do this thing differently, but actually you're kind of locked in an environment where it's really difficult to do it. So I think that sort of moving beyond a cognitive understanding of listening is just, oh, if we have the insight, suddenly all the structures will change. I think it's really important. Right. Mm -hmm. So maybe that brings me to my next bigger question that I had, which was, mm -hmm. as Nicole was framing it much more elegantly, the infrastructure of listening so how does this infrastructure look like in a place like Australia, which was what Eric was really talking about. So there's certain, you know, aspects like gender, ethnicity, mm -hmm. race, like all plays into it. And maybe you can talk again from your experience or your professional practice about the infrastructure of that listening. What does listening look like? Maybe talk to us a bit about the positives that you've encountered or maybe what technology has changed about listening or has it improved it, has it diminished it? I'm just finding from teaching here, and I've been teaching it for six years, some things with the students you can tell they're not listening at all because you're competing with the students so much. So seeing and listening to me like become kind of like contradictory things at the moment. And then the question is always how do you kind of get them back into this space of active listening? So um, 
this end of like the second week, they can, they swear, they listen to everything you said and they have done half of it. So it was very interesting to know. Um, yeah. yeah, I could extend on that. Yeah. Um, and it's kind of an extension of what you were just saying as well. Because um, I, my work sort of draws on personal experience and a refusal to listen to certain things is very interesting to me. And it's like probably quite a universal experience. Um, but for me, and I, I channeled this experience to a lot of my work is encountering, uh, I'm non-binary and trying to explain that to people is very, very interesting to me. Um, and it's the kind of people at a pub that you might find who have this idea that they, it could possibly be because they've discovered everything. <laughs> There's no information left to listen to. Um, and then on your point, the way that I interpret that is like very grandiose, but um, back to the kind of cosmological stuff that I channel, it's the ability for people's perception to change based on, I guess, modes of information. So I made a video where I'm embodying singularities or black holes, and they're speaking to the audience. And it's kind of in a way where it's like, you don't understand, you shouldn't even bother, you shouldn't look, how dare you? But it's kind of this like enraged feeling that's kind of um, uh, involuntary sometimes when that stuff. But then to also listen to the other side of what they're saying, because there's a sort of more peaceful one. <laughs> it's sort of saying there are different ways to look at this because a singularity um, is sort of the limit of our understanding. But singularities exist in other ways as well. And they always have. A singularity would have been way beyond where we are now in the past, if that makes sense. So things have changed a lot technologically, which I think is interesting. That's what I'm fixated on. <laughs> and before we hear from the others, Mike, just because one quick point for a lot of them. So when you put your work out, right, so what, yeah. um, what do you think people respond, like how do people respond to it? Where do you put it out? What's the kind of the echo, the reverberations? What do you hear when you put things out to be heard? Yeah, I can speak from the show that's uh, current. Um, people who, it's a mixed reception. People are really scared of them because I've made them scary, <laughs> like these black hole figures, because they are speaking at you quite angrily. Um, but a lot of people just fixated by it because I've made them really colorful and sort of glittery. <laughs> and then because of that, they listen to all of it. And it's a five minute video or so, but they always come out going, I think I get that, which I find it's really good. That's successful for me. <laughs> I was surprised, but they listen. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so I work with RAT, and um, and so I came into the uh, so we we work at the MCA together, where Gallery House, and I came into the institution with a singularity sort of uh, attitude um, because I didn't really know much about anything uh, about binary um, uh, existence, and RAT being my teacher, uh, so I gingerly went up and asked <laughs> fingernails and uh, and. Um, because he commented on, on somebody's fingernail polish um, uh, in the gallery. And I said, so t tell me about your fingernail polish. And, and, and so this is the way that I could actually start to have a conversation with Rat about what I didn't know about. So I wanted to know, I wanted to show him that I was going to listen to what he was going to say. And so, yeah, it was about sitting there and actually listening. And, and uh, yeah, uh, Rat's a... a a great teacher in that way. So, so Thank this you. is a, so this is a, um, this is a, this is why I really wanted Rad to come along because I really want um, to have open up this conversation, you know. And it's really sad to hear that in Iran um, there is no conversation like this, you know. And 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 um, yeah, that's a, that's what I really want to say. I, I just, yeah, from my point. But then just going on a bit more about the infrastructure, I think, you know, as Eric just pointed out, conversation is one of the bridges there. But maybe going back to Nicole and um, John as well, or, you know, so, but again, what does this infrastructure of listening look like in your practice, in your experience with, I think that point is really interesting about the scary singularity. Yeah, <laughs> like the so, literary yeah. Can I again jump in? Uh, so I'll just jump in again. Uh, I had, a, so in the MCA, the, the infrastructure there, is uh, we've got labeling down low and uh, this lady came in and said why is the labeling down so low and i said well because of the wheelchair access and people 
with wheelchairs can see the the labor one percent of people one percent of people we have to, we have to bend down and i and I, I got it back and i said well you know one percent of people yeah but you know now we're an inclusive society we actually allow these people to actually see the label at that high and it's quite a nice thing to do and the MCA is an inclusive, uh, uh, and it showed me that they were inclusive because they, I'm an older person. So for for somebody to um, hire me, um, well, it meant a great deal to me. So so, and she was an older person. So so it's bringing it back to the person that's actually doing the the the, the being be mean really, and um, and that's the way I go about it in in that uh, in that setting. So, but, yeah. And again, Nicole, if have you wanted to... Yeah, I mean, I'm just kind of, in some ways, your art, Eric, is interesting because it kind of, it, it because I've done, done a little bit of stuff about hearing devices and deafness, it sort of like uses a metaphor that puts the empowered person as the, you know, the non-listener. But in some senses, it's it's kind of ironic to me because I'd say deaf and hard of hearing people are often the best listeners, like so flexible. I've had so many experiences, I've been learning sign language for many years, of just the the willingness of deaf people to switch tracks. Okay, oh, okay, we can't communicate this way. Oh, does someone have a pen and paper or can we use gesture or, oh, does someone have some ASL or, you know what I mean? Just being, oh, I've got my, my app that's that can transliterate. And that... I think there's a really interesting parallel to, you know, monocultural or monolingual environments where people, and I wonder whether this is hearing people more broadly or is it uh, hearing people in Anglophone worlds where they're not used to code switching? Mm. Maybe that's that's an issue. It might be. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I just find it really interesting to think about the actually the, the, the one of the infrastructures that we might consider, like you're saying, Eric, in the context of captioning. I'm not, I'm not sure that universal design always works, but flexibility of kind of modes of communicating and willingness to to take on a different paradigm and sort of go oh okay this doesn't work for everybody you know i mean mm-hmm. for example i don't know the quiet hours that they have in shopping centers now for neurodiverse people mm-hmm. there's a kind of an attention to diverse needs in that mm-hmm. action but there's also a sort of an understanding that, that people's kind of sensoria differ, you know, and so having to be aware of that all the time, I think is that's that's one of the ways you can make a listening infrastructure is just be willing to change things, you know. And one, one good example of that was when I was sitting up downstairs, a man came in and said, oh, my, my daughter's deaf. And, um, and it was really interesting that when she went through the cochlear implant, um, um, getting a cochlear implant, we were put into a room to hear what what um, my daughter would hear. Mm. And she said it was garble. It was garble that they were that, that that we were listening to. But I'm so proud of my daughter that she can actually make English out of that. Mm. And th- that was such a mm. and that was from just looking at my drawings, you know. So that's I thought, so interesting. Yeah, we we're, we're getting some of it. And that's I think as you know, Nicole, you were saying there's now try ones and I don't know if people are following these news, but um, there's a supermarket chain in the Netherlands, and they're actually now offering chatty cash out. But, um, <laughs> Such a great idea. <laughs> there's a lot of older people living by themselves, and then there's this phenomenon of um, over, you know, singlification. So a lot of people living by themselves, and it's called like this, this new pandemic of social loneliness. And they're being offered a special cash out, well, a checkout where they can just talk to the cashier. There's nobody pushing you on. Such a good idea. And it's so <laughs> successful. That they now got, I think, like ten percent more revenue wow. because of that, because people wanting to talk and then they're finding it interesting. Yeah. So they have specific dedicated lanes to be like yeah. you know? And I think that's the the cliche of accommodating is not, you know, helping capitalism when people go <laughs> factoring. But again, that would maybe Savi can talk a bit about it because I've got another question about technology actually in that case. But yeah. uh, when I came to Australia, I was thinking, okay, wow, I have a platform i have a voice democracy fantastic and then gradually i was learning how the roof of freedom of speech is you know it's limited because then i went to australian film television and radio school to uh study documentary filmmaking um they would keep asking me australian content otherwise you will not be granted you would not have money to make any film 
And I was thinking, I just arrived in Australia. I don't know anything about Australia. And um, I made my first short film. Um, I Because I escaped from Iran with my little daughter. She was little. Now she's taller than me. <laughs> and um, she's, she's, she was a cellist in Sydney Youth Orchestra. And now she's doing musical. I filmed her underwater because, and it was her struggle to be heard. And you know, underwater, you cannot hear anyone. And um, later on, when I start to make my second film, again, the struggle was, the problem was Australian content. Otherwise I could not make my landmark documentary. And I came with the idea, okay, I know because I was campaigner against execution in Iran, and I was thinking, I don't have any idea about Australia, Australia's history, but I know so many things about execution. And I made my second documentary about first Australian female parliamentarian whose father was executed in Australia, I think 80 years ago, 19, 90 years ago. And it was interesting because uh, my supervisor told me, it's interesting, the uh, theme of suffocation and struggle or claustrophobia is a common theme of all of your work, your uh, cre creative practices. And gradually I learned how can I um, talk with visual languages. People would not bully my accent. People would not judge me. And uh, Islamic Republic sympathizer would less bully me because it's difficult for them to understand the metaphor. Is that, is that sense? <laughs> no, no, I mean, it's yeah, it was my experience. And later on, when I started to write about uh, women and children uh, in detention center on offshore detention regime on Nauru, I realized I always was thinking about a Spivak argument, article, can subaltern speak? And through my work writing about those women in on Nauru detention regime in Western context, I was thinking, yes, we can talk, but who going to listen to them? And that's why I created Writing and Resistance Project in collaboration with the Art Gallery of New South Wales and Red Room. And I tried to use my personal experience to mentor them to tell their own story without pastorization of media system um, in a poetic structure, because in that way, people listen to them much, much more than before. And in this way, we can humanize the narrative, which has been dehumanized through media, through advocacy system and policy. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think you can see now all these threads around listening and um, being listened to coming together there, which brings me to my next question, that's okay, which is about technology and uh, how does technology play a part in this process of getting people to listen, speaking in other ways? Um, how, how can do I jump on this one? I was teaching exactly this one today. <laughs> <laughs> Cyberspace, you know, the digital uh, platforms, I think it's a kind of, there are so many limitations to be involved in the digital platforms and online environment, but I think cyberspace um, provided in some level, some form of liberty and emancipation for women in, as I said, in a carceral spaces such as Iran and detention system. But I acknowledge and I am one of those people constantly, I have been trolled a lot. And as you know, yeah, we agree. and there is another limitation that can, um, you know, Islamic Republic regime, they recruited 2000 people on their cyber army. You know, they are paying people to use cyberspace to silencing people. But in another way, with all those uh, limitation, I think their cyberspace provided massive amount of uh, emancipatory space for suppressed people who don't have any representation in human rights industry or media um, within Iran and um, as I said in detention regime, for example, you know, just women who do who do not have any representation in me Iranian Islamic Republic media system. They feel they take out their hijab 
they fire their hijab um, and they feel themselves and they share their idea and their own reality through cyberspace and through cyberspace they can deterritorialize, colonize territory. Fascinating. And if, oh. yeah, the technology, they technology. Uh, it right Yeah, the positive and negative side. Yeah. <laughs> Um, we might just go down whoever wants to answer or has something they would like to add that technology and listening, speaking, hearing. It's hard to generalise. I think, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, I think the moment of hyperbole is over about the internet. And I think, you know, there's, it, it's easy to have a kind of um, hu a heuristic about internet spaces that suggest that all problematic or new technology suggests that all problematic. I used to do a lecture where we took, I got little snippets about, you know, things people said about the novel, things people said about silent cinema, things people said about video games, they're all the same. You know, they'll, <laughs> oh, they'll, they'll make everybody randy and have too short attention spans and the working class people will, you know, be, you know, even children will be corrupted. So that, I found that really interesting. But so I'm, I'm kind of always a bit wary about making broader generalisations. But I think the lens that I think is interesting from, I think the deaf studies has brought to the um, to these kinds of debates and disability studies as well, is to try and think about technologies beyond a paradigm that's about individual, um, and here I'm thinking more assistive technologies, beyond individual amelioration or normalisation of bodies, you know, so the, the person who might be struggling to, to hear, um, having to be responsible for managing the environment such that they can hear and try and use technologies as a way of, um, I get a famous writer in this area, Alan Rolson says, kind of ameliorating environments rather than ameliorating individuals or, you know, kind of getting individuals to have to internalise the need to constantly do extra work, to constantly, you know, be responsible for, for making sense of what other people are saying. So I think if if we analyse the ways um, media technologies, assistive technologies are used to, to think about, okay, so what ways are we changing the environment rather than just changing individuals' capacity to engage? I think that's a good thing to do. And that's a brilliant point. And it goes back to um, something I saw on YouTube now, really being popular, this genre of, you know, first time the person hears something, the, the implant or something that gets turned on. Oh God, like, yeah, all of the content, so like all of the comments that go, Oh, yeah, no, that's fantastic. And then some advocates go, but maybe that person doesn't want it. And that's a lot of pressure. So as you say, you know, it's... So it's a kind of rhetoric of technology is that, and the magic bullet and the idea that all deaf people got cochlear implants, which they don't, and that cochlear implants instantly change people's hearing, which they don't, mm -hmm. and that, uh, you know, that somehow you can just ameliorate individual bodies and then everybody else can go on doing the same stuff. We don't need to change anything. We don't need to take responsibility for communication or flexibility of communication. We'll just leave it to the deaf person to do all the extra work, you know. Mm. So I guess, I guess, you know, it ties it back to Eric about yeah. that might have, yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Hopefully we can talk a bit more because we have about five minutes left for the discussion and then throw it to the audience, but maybe Joe. Yeah. Uh, it, I'm not going on from what you said, I'm going on. Just in terms of technology, you know, and not about my art, <laughs> I'm really fascinated by what's happening to children who aren't being listened to by their parents because their parents are on the phone. Mm -hmm. um, I've watched children down at Bondi nearly drown because their parents are on the phone. I've watched people, you know, people used to walk with their babies in the pram looking at them. Now what people do is they, the baby's facing out and they're on their phone. Um, I'm watching it all the time. I spoke to a woman the other day who's an occupational therapist and uh, I was very touched by this woman because uh, she started telling me experiences of working with children and how a lot of the children with behavioural problems were actually hadn't, weren't being listened to by their parents. And I did just start to tell this story before, but this woman told a story about a little girl. She was like, I think, about a six-year-old getting into a lot of trouble at school, um, sent to the occupational therapist, um, and she was quite suspicious of her because, you know, there was another professional person trying to fix her. Um, and, and this woman was the best listener I've ever come across. And she would have been listening on body-wise. She watches gestures and she was she was really there for that little girl. And the little girl said to her, okay, you are like the angel Gabriel to me and I can I can work with you. 
she said. And I just feel like, you know, just on a broader level, you know, the ability to actually listen. Stop. To actually listen and be quiet and not competitive in in our just our daily lives, you know. And and I think that, you know, I, I get upset with watching the parents on the phones, you know. Um, and I understand what undivided attention does for a child and I worry about these future generations. Actually. Yeah. <laughs> we do that in the gallery. <laughs> yeah. And we might come back to that in terms of like, I think I might have stressed it. So the Australasian um, Humor Studies Network is about humor and we've got one of the members here, Professor Rob Fidian, who might be able to talk a bit more about because there's meme going around of a mum looking on the phone and then the baby was like, I think almost run over by a car. So it was, mm. the mean went viral and people were like, is this like shaming the mother? As you know, Nicole was saying, like, who are we shaming? Who at whose expense? And like paying attention and listening, I think goes in that direction. So maybe that's something to figure out later. Um, last question before we um, actually hand it to Zaba and um, your poem. Um, and this might be a curveball for some, but how does humor, <laughs> to keep it in the theme of the you know, network. How does humor factor into all of this? Eric, you know from your eyes. Um, so maybe you want to get us oh, going absolutely. Into humor factor into listening and being heard. So my my herbs, um, I use humor as a starting point. And, um, and because I'm a cartoonist, well, I was a cartoonist, now an artist. Um, I, it's always something that that's the, the in, for, it allows uh, an audience to come to my work with a laugh and then uh, a bit like Joan coming in with a punch at the end, you know, but, but it's about, it's about bringing the, the listener in actually. Yeah. It's about bringing the listener in and maybe contemplating, but you know, I mean, that's a, that's a bit wafty uh, to think that people will contemplate what I'm, what I've done uh, would, would change their mind, but Maybe we're starting with that conversation and it's just fantastic conversation that we had today um, about maybe, um, yeah, opening up this big paradigm that, that, that could get us to a point where we can actually sit and listen to each other in one big room for a long time and not say a word. <laughs> anyway, that's, that's my hope. <laughs> I've got a good one from the bio at the start because it was mentioned that I do bad art competitions. And it's true. And I call them <laughs> talentation. But <laughs> I mention that when I write little artist bios like that, because it's actually quite important, even though it's a side little joke thing with friends. But you set it up, uh, people just show up, there's a theme. <clears throat> so the last one was sound art, anything goes. And it's amazing because it's mostly artists that come. It's amazing how critical they become of things that they've noticed in the art world and it usually gets quite political <laughs> and I record it all and take great inspiration from it. I don't know if I've used it really yet, but stand by. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think that, look, humour is a way of disarming people mm. and where they can sort of soften a little bit. You know, they're not, you know, it, sometimes when we're confronted too harshly, we don't listen, we stop listening. But when we, you know, are, are approaching in a different way, we actually listen. I use, uh, I don't like to talk about being funny, but I do actually uh, use a lot of humour to seduce people. Yeah, looking at your eyes, I think there's such subtlety around the humours where you're using the neon car anyway. I thought, yeah. <laughs> um, just come to the Brisbane conference next year, present, you know, <laughs> looking forward to it. Nicole, Nicole you know. I mean, again, uh, my PhD about a billion, billion years ago was about comedy film. And I, I kind of think that we can, you yeah, yeah, know, <laughs> back in the Paleolithic era. But um, I kind of think it, in some ways humour can go both ways. People like to think of humour as being something that's potentially um, transgressive and shaking things up. But I guess I've always been interested as well in the way that humour can be used to kind of articulate quite... Um, conservative views as well. So I think, it, you know, it's it's not a, an automatic uh, opening of minds and doors. Um, and, yeah, I think as long as we think about it that way, it's, it certainly is useful. I think there's a bit of a tendency in human studies to want to see it as 
you know, always always a fine thing. <laughs> but I'm not sure that it always is, but it's interesting. <laughs> Can we come back to this in a moment? Mm -hmm. okay. I think humor is a skill and it can add uh, aesthetic to the discussion to you know just soften all those harsh arguments about you know, just when you talk about colonialism post-colonialism state violence you know those kind of topic whenever i'm talking i realize oh my god you know just i get a slap on my face if i go further <laughs> and on deeper level so yeah i think and i, I try to build up this skill in Australia because in Iran, if you, as a woman, if you have a sense of humor, it would be really not very appropriate. <laughs> they stigmatize you as a person who is crossing the border of chastity, you know, morality. <laughs> so, um, but in Australia, I realized, no, there is another form of, um, you know, censorship or more, you know, I need to be very careful when I'm talking about gendered racism, for example, in a very serious way. And then I start to develop this scheme. I'm in the at the beginning of this journey <laughs> because, yeah, for whole of my life, I learned to be very serious in order to you know, comply with all those <laughs> regulations. And yeah. But I think I, I was born in Glasgow, and if I didn't have a sense of humour, I got slapped. Yeah. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, OK. It's a leveler. Yeah. 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 yeah, women should, <laughs> probably. Yeah. yeah. Right. Well, thanks so much. This is the first bit. We're going to have, have the discussion in a moment. Um, shifting gears now, turn a bit back to um, maybe the not humorous part, but Zaba, would you like to do the poem? Sure, let's do it. And break. then we... Um, have the Q&A bit where I'm going to start again come very clear to the mic. Torafthiyo dilam qameem shod Qareeq akhyaud hashim shod Azan shabi kebar nagashti جهان که شادی آفرین بود به چشم من قم آفرین شد از آن شبی که بر نگشت I orbit like a sun forgetful of how to shed either light or warmth i turn and turn a nameless gypsy the world most frantic sunflower we are not alone in our loneliness exile is a crowded solitude this spike world is overrun with outsiders and i am an outsider look at the owl see how haunts her wings around her hollowness and sleeps but every morning she calls the broken branches perish do we think we are less than the bats that hang and intone their anguish to the dark? Are we less than the rooster whose early morning never knew a night? The clocks still run on Greenwich main time, but perhaps this place is another time now, and here perhaps it's God who faces the firing squad, not us, and no longer, and no longer will we need to dress up our cases in disguise. We are not strangers anymore, neither estranged nor estranged. Here alone, we are all of us kin. Thank you. Yeah.
And again, thanks to all of the guests so far. That was just brilliant. As you, as you can see, very different takes and approaches and ways of listening and being listened to and being heard. Um, now we're going to throw it open for questions from the audience. Again, I'm going to come around. If you have a question, please let me know. <laughs> hey, thank you. That was really uh, fascinating to uh, listen to. Um, when you were uh, in your opening talk, Eric, you um, said that um, you want to be listened to, and I, I really responded to that. It, it felt very earnest and something that's quite relatable. Um, and I think um, I wanted to ask in response as a general question to everyone here, um, is there, what was the, how do I word it? Um, how do you maintain or feel a conviction in your want to be listened to? Um, how, why do you want to be listened to? What, what makes you feel a purpose in that? Um, I guess I'm asking because that's something I struggle with. <laughs> Should I answer? Uh, so for me, uh, it's an internal process that needs, um, that happens every time I, I start drawing or I start doing an artwork. So once that artwork becomes, I want it to be listened to. I think that's probably the only, and then that I use Instagram in that way. I, I don't really care what I put on Instagram as long as it's something that I've produced and, uh, and has meaning to me. And I think that's, um, that's a, a, hu um, a basic human need, I think. I can talk about it as well. Um, I don't know, I'm not uh, an advocate for any voice other than mine. So for me, I still have stuff to say. That's literally it. And I just have an urge <laughs> to make art. <laughs> it's, yeah, I think it's kind of a primal urge, really. Mm. Yeah. Listen to me. Yeah, <laughs> that's pretty much it. Yeah. <laughs> so I think it's fine. I think it's human desire to be connected, to be loved, to be respected, to belong to some somewhere, to some community. Yeah. You know, we, it's our nature to be in the community. So when someone le you think you are listened, you have been heard, it gives you some sense of belonging, respect, love. Yeah. I'm kind of interested in the role of someone like myself might play not as a person saying something in my own right, although I do do some life writing stuff and I'm interested in that. But um, but as what um, my colleague Tanya Dreyer said, um, uh, described as listening brokers, like I think there are structures that can be created where there's amplification of certain types of voices, where you can, you know, try and gather together or comment on or supplement the work of other people who are trying to speak, you know, sort of say, okay, look at this, this is worth listening to. So I think that idea of, so I guess curators play that role or Ben might be playing that role in this environment, you know, as a person who actually brings together people talking about their own experiences. So I think that's a sort of undervalued kind of role, broker, brokering and kind of curating or caretaking lived experience narratives. They tend to get generated and then they kind of fall by the wayside, a bit of soft money or whatever. Maybe it's the same with the art world. Um, so I think that idea of oh, actually these things require maintenance and they require people to disseminate them and share them. And I can kind of think in my academic work, I can try to contribute to that a little bit. I think as a, I'm preliminarily and I'm primarily an artist, uh, but I'm a teacher. Mm. And I, and I want to talk to people about work. I want to talk to people about things that I think they're not listening to. And I approach my work from many different levels. So my work is very layered. Uh, my video animations are used in schools a lot. I'm in the curriculum. And I am absolutely love that because, you know, I, I made my work very much, very purposely, so I could communicate. And so people would listen and children would listen to things that they weren't listening to, that the Australian population, I didn't think, was hearing. 
Just very quickly, uh, thank you for your contributions. Um, do you feel political correctness has um, compromised the way you like to be heard or express your opinions? I think that the word political correctness doesn't, no one really uses it to talk about their own practices, you know, it's always used as a term to describe other people's practices. And, you know, I'm pretty old now, so you know, back in the sort of the 80s when I first went to uni, then in Australia we didn't really use that term, We might, except ironically, you know, ideological soundness might have been the more tongue-in-cheek version of the same thing. So, I mean, I kind of think that it's it's a term that is used to describe what other people are doing. But in my view, a kind of, you know, Noam Chomsky talks about, uh, you know, the best way to make people think there's a debate is to allow very free debate within a very, very limited sphere <laughs> and pretend there's no outside to that. And I often think that the media scape is a bit like that. So, you know, I don't know, the Greens being seen as crazy bonkers lefties, you know what I mean, in the Australian political scene, really they're not, they're kind of social democrats. In Germany they would be like very standard mainstream party. So we've managed to create an environment in which the sphere of debate is so small that little tiny moves outside that space get seen as, oh, look, the crazy lefties are at it again, or look at these bonkers feminists or whatever. So I kind of think, um, I think the idea that somehow, and I also think we don't pay enough attention to the spheres where certain things are policed and the spheres, spheres where they're not policed. So you get great anxiety about political correctness on campus, but actually the bigger spaces, the wider spaces that we have are, you know, highly dominated by a very, very narrow range of voices. You know, usually, you know, Murdoch papers, usually, you know, middle class people, white people, et cetera, et cetera. So the spaces that are sort of alternative spaces where your work might be foregrounded or, you know, perhaps universities, perhaps, you know, an alternative cafe. People get very hot and bothered about the limited number of voices there, but not really hot and bothered about, you know, the perspective in No Flies on You, but the Australian, for instance, you know what I mean, which has been so homogenous for so long. So I just kind of think, oh, well, really, why are we worried about that? It doesn't, it do, that doesn't worry me in the slightest. I'm much more worried about the media scape more broadly. Mm, I can add to that as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. But it's like, I feel that if people sort of use that term, it's usually not accurate either. So in my work, no, because when I'm creating work, it's usually in a kind of listening dialogue with things that I might think might not be okay. Um, and, you know, sometimes they get chopped out and mm. that's it. That's the political correctness, I guess. Um, and usually that term is used by people when it's sort of directed at them for missteps that they've made. Um, and I think it's pretty easy not to make those if you start the dialogue with listening mm. rather than putting stuff out and then getting told that it's not okay. So, and also, I just want to say one more thing about political correctness, they're, they're, they're polemics. So they're big polemics on one side, big polemics on the other. But there's a Venn diagram that shows there's a little gray line in between them, and I think you said it in the spiel, that there is, a place for us to start the conversation in that, in that, in that polemic. So the one polemic, the other polemic. There is a space there that we can start having a conversation. And Stan Grant talked about that when he was talking about Adam Goods and the way that he got he got hammered on the field. That that Adam Goods was trying to talk about his feelings, but nobody was listening, and and that. That was a space that we that he wants to occupy. He wants to occupy that grey space so that that we can talk about Adam Good's feelings. We can talk about uh, why racism's there, and then and then there's a the grey space. And then maybe if we can, if we as a society can dwell within that grey space, I think we can we can start uh, you know doing this sort of stuff. You know, and opening up the conversation. There's a new discourse which is emerging, which is draws upon human knowledge, but is a machine, machine language, and it's a machine rationale. How do you, how do you see that? Is is about it, it's. I think it's going to have ramifications as far as what people listen to and and the new authority, if you want to call it that. But it, it, it's a. It's an authority with, 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 that is problematic 
in a lot of ways. I mean, we've already seen some of the consequences of that, but it will become more authoritative as it becomes more machine-like, I guess, and less human, I think. Well, in art, I think it's become boring already. <laughs> uh, because really, when we see what AI can do in art, we see it over and over and over again, and it's not, it's not progressive. But I, I'm using it in my own practice. And it is, it, you know, you start using it, you can't, you, you, you just play it. it. It's a jumping off point for ideas and it can, it can generate thousands of ideas. And so it, it's a tool, but that's not always the way that it's going to be used. And it depends on whether it's a corporation using it or whether it's an individual or a community um, and so forth. And it's also and it's also um, counteractive with me because I'm using digital imagery, and uh, and people would think that that was already produced by an AI, you know. So yeah, yeah, it is. Uh, that's why I try to paint over the top of my paintings to show that I've actually got agency. So they, yeah. I want to talk about Grimes because she made a video recently, and I'm not a huge advocate for Grimes, you know, the musician, but she did say something really interesting recently about chess and how chess is like a AI free environment when it comes to human appreciation of it. Um, and I think there's going to be a similar potential thing with things like painting where the human aspects of art are the valued bits and that the AI bits are there. So people still verse AI chess um, and it's still important, it's still used and it's still chess, but it's not the product that we're looking for. I think it'll be it won't, really. Yeah. It's very interesting though, isn't it? I mean, what happens when, you know, medical students start, hmm. you know, not learning, just using chat GPT, like? Well, I, I think it can accelerate learning. Mm. Um, it's recording on here. Um, yeah. Quite, quite significantly and in different ways. So you use it as a kind of jumping off point, for example, um, there were some scientists who recently, they were looking at um, ways that AI could help with immunology and things like this. And what it did was generate 40,000 possibility new chemical. Uh, so, okay, it's going to benefit pharmaceutical companies, but it's also going to benefit some people uh, health-wise. So, it's a kind of jumping off point for those medical, those scientific students. So I think it's going to become a really useful tool in a lot of ways. But on the other hand, it's going to blur the distinctions between truth, let's, it can distort reality. I mean, it is interesting because like I, I have a fairly uh, wide brain. Uh, I, can, I can come up really quite quickly with eight different ways to approach a number of different objects, for example. Uh, but I can't come up with it that quickly. And so when I've done it and I've watched what it does, I can't help but to want to use it sometimes as a jumping off point. It's just like, oh my God, I never thought of that, yes. <laughs> you know, yes. ever. So we might just, because we only have time for, so sorry, we have time for one more question. And I think, you know, if you'd like to continue that discussion, because I think that's fascinating, you know, can you unsee or unhear these things? Yeah, so that is really, you know, that is, um, that, like, <laughs> but anyway, um, one more question before we have to close out. So there's a, there's also an element of collaboration that we can collaborate with the AI and, uh, and artistically we can, I've thought about how I can collaborate with AI and, uh, it would be interesting to, because I'm quite a fast drawer, I'd be, I'd be interested to see how fast I can draw to what AI can produce, you know, but. I'm sure that AI will produce a beautiful uh, finished rendering and I'll have a little line work. But I know, but also I the thing about it is it's computer generated. And, uh, and when we're talking about the actual hand, that's yes. what you're saying. People are going to start valuing as time goes by the hand. It's going to be an interesting question. Oh, it's going to be oh, interesting. Oh, and another. How <laughs> that's going to affect people listening, particularly yeah. what they listen to. Oh, yeah. Another um, element of the AI is that it's all 
derivative of what we've already made. That's it. Which is interesting as well. It's been put in. Yeah. yeah. Been... Which I can't get my head around. So. Yeah. Okay. Oh, thank you. Just go. And the of what you're saying about health in particular, that um, I heard on the health report the other day that there was a study done comparing the sort of empathetic murmurings of AI to, as in chatbot form, to actual doctors talking to patients and AI, it won every time of actual doctors. It was more empathetic according to, you know, and I was like, wow, that's, I don't know where that goes, but it just kind of made me think, mm, okay, maybe we need to step back from humanism and have a little bit of a think about it. Yeah, well, there's no librarians here. Uh, I think right you go up to a computer and say, I've got all a list of you know, recently cited articles. Can you summarise them for me? It will make up something, probably. That's the problem you're wanting to, <laughs> isn't it? Maybe, maybe this separate. should be the class in the medical school uh, on empathy. Im improve and improve yeah. on the bot. <laughs> I like but, in, <laughs> but in robotics, we, we had somebody at, uh, at the conference talking about robotics and saying, well, no, a robot will never over overtake the human human form. So. Well, they also had a robot there that they wanted to laugh realistically like an actual person at somebody's jokes. I think they were trying to save all, you know, the, the women out there from bad man jokes and um, have a robot laugh at them or something like that. And it did not work out. So that was an interesting project there. Um, we're almost out of time. So I just had one last question, unless there's another question there. Um, I was just wanting to know, and this is something I had thought about. So if you feel completely uncomfortable, you do not have, not have to answer that. What's the favourite word that you would like to hear over and over again? What's the favourite thing, the word that's your most favourite thing to hear? Which word is that? Empathy for me. Safety. I can't think of a word. The sound of eucalyptus leaves rustling in the trees. That would be what I would like to listen to. <laughs> Ask you so much. I like enthusiastic squealing, <laughs> laughter, <laughs> so it's good. I'm going for a magpie. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, we are out of time. Thank you so much for the discussion. Thanks to the audience for coming. <laughs>